American West. Once it could have been the British, Spanish, or even the Russian West. It became American primarily because of the explorations of two young army officers, Meriwether Lewis and William Clark. Their pioneering journey stands as one of the great achievements in the history of the United States. You too, Goodrich. Get over here and tend to this gear. If there was any engine snooping around, it would have been stolen long ago. Uh, Captain Clark, uh, what if a sergeant lost his voice? Uh, would he get demoted to private? Because <laughs> that prior is a very good man. Well, it's just jokey, sir. The river's getting more and more difficult, especially for the red longboat. Well, sir, it was built for the deep, wide Missouri. And not this narrow, fast Missouri. Huh? Well, that's about it, sir. Sergeant Pryor says you know how to make a cache in the Indian style. Yes, sir. Two pirogues. They want to hide the red one and cache some of the heavier gear. And the greater part of the scientific specimens we've collected since Fort Mandan. We'll continue with the white one, although we may have to make one or two small dugouts to supplement our canoes. We rise behind us, sir. That looks like it's above the high water mark. We'll make sure of it, that. This cache must stay dry. There will be irreplaceable items stored in it. Yes, sir. And we'd rather not have the Indians discovered after we leave and they come poking around our campsite. Oh, I can disguise it. I need three men to work with me in relays. That is, if you want the job done, sir. Pick them and start after the noon meal. Yes, sir. Captain Clark. Captain Lewis, I need help. What's the trouble, Charbonneau? Sucker Julia. I- I've never seen her so sick. She says she's going to die. Horizons West, the continued story of the Lewis and Clark expedition. Now, with Harry Bartell as Meriwether Lewis and John Anderson as William Clark, listen to Chapter 5, The Great Falls. The Lewis and Clark Corps of Discovery was only a day's travel beyond the junction of Mariah's River and the Missouri in the north-central part of what is now the state of Montana. The men had declared that Mariah's River was the correct route west. The two captains had stood for the Missouri, the route which the expedition now followed. Despite the difference of opinion, the men were loyally following their leaders. Now, however, more problems faced them. Travel upstream had become increasingly hard, and there was the constant urgency of having to reach the mountains before winter closed in and made further travel impossible. Dr. Julia, I I am back. Captain Clark, Captain Lewis, you have brought them. Yes, yes, they will make you well again. The baby... I will quiet you. Huh? I do not know what will happen to the baby if I die. There, there. Be a good boy. Huh? No more crying. How long have you been sick, Dr. Jewel? Three days. I hoped the pain would go away and I would not become a burden. Now, where do you feel this pain? The needle of my body. Sometimes like the sharp knife. Sometimes like the heavy club. You don't mind if I examine you, Dr. Jewel? You are a medicine man. Do what your art tells you. Uh, Meriwether, help me turn her on her back. Of course. Oh. Oh. Uh, easy. Easy. There. She seems very warm to the touch. It's a high fever. Dr. Jewel, uh, have you tried to eat anything today? No. Let's see. Now, I'm going to put some pressure on your stomach. Can you tell me where it hurts? Here? Here? Hurt a little? Mm-hmm. There? Oh. Meriwether, did you bring along that box of Dr. Rush's pills? Yes, I did. Charbonneau, come here a minute. 
What can I do, Captain? Give her these two pills with a little water. Then make some cold compresses to reduce this fever. We'll look in again in the morning. Will I die? Now, not if we can help it. You stay flat on your back. Let your husband take care of you and the baby. Come on, Mary Weather. Well, Mary Weather, what do you think? I don't like to say it, but it seems to me like the sickness that killed Sergeant Floyd. Floyd's abdomen is much more sensitive to the touch. And so hers will be tomorrow. Well, all we can do is wait and see. Of course, the men can use time in camp to make new clothes, repair equipment. A day or two in camp, no matter what they're doing, they'll turn it into a morale problem. I mean, time is passing, and we're no nearer the mountains and the Shoshones and the horses they can trade us. Most of our men don't think that far ahead. They just think that we're leading them in the wrong direction. Most of them still believe Mariah's River is the Missouri. The Great Falls will prove her right. The Mandan said it was a feature of the upper Missouri, and so did Sacagawea. I think I have a solution, Billy. You stay here and doctor Sacagawea, and I'll take a few men and reconnoiter upriver. Good idea. After you've actually seen the falls, every man will know we're on the right path. If I were you, I think I'd start at dawn. Pedria, Goodrich, Gibson, and Joe P. Fine, fine. Now let's have a look at that cache. We move toward the rise where Cruzat and Goodrich were working. We stopped short of them as we heard their voices. Only four feet ago, Rick, after all this time. You sound more like a sergeant every day. Oh, time in grade, Charles, my boy. <laughs> Plus experience and brains, I suppose. Uh, naturally. Gee. <laughs> Yes, sir, senior private. If fiddles were rifles, you'd be a general. <laughs> Captain Clark. Grisat, Goodrich, a little less talk and more digging. Yes, Sergeant. Come on, Billy, let's have a closer look. Well, it looks pretty good, Grisat. The chunk of pod we first got is two and a half feet in diameter. We're widening the opening little by little as we go down. It'll end up seven feet deep and seven feet across the bottom, sir. While we watched, Shields and Bratton came in, and Pryor had them tote dirt away and dump it into the river. By evening, the cache was finished, ready to receive the articles we would store there the next morning. I was worried about Merriweather the next morning. He ate no breakfast, complained of stomach pains as he shouldered his pack and hurried Gibson. Rudyard, Joe Fields, and Goodrich, along the bank of the river. I watched them until they were lost to sight in a clump of cottonwoods. Then I supervised the loading of our heavy goods into the cache. Blacksmith tools, spare rations, gunpowder and lead canisters, and, of course, specimens. These were placed on a floor of dry twigs. Animal skins were spread on top, and then cruzettes filled in with dirt. Finally, we placed a two-and-a-half-foot circle of sod. Oh, looks pretty natural, doesn't it, In a sir? few days, nobody would be able to see where your spade touched ground. And now I look for a place to hide the red boat. Uh, maybe that islet in the middle of the river. Well, that's what I was thinking, sir. Yeah, Captain Clark, Sacagawea is no better this morning. And I've worn myself out running to and from the river to make coal come You're complaining, Charbonneau. You ought to be glad to do something to help her. Uh, but I'm not helping, Captain. This futile, she will die. Well, we'll try something else. Maybe, maybe I ought to bleed her. Bleed her? You mean take away blood of a woman who's already too weak? Only a small amount. Most doctors consider it an effective treatment. Uh, if you say so, Captain, but please, uh, do not kill her. We stopped before dark to make camp and eat, but I had lost my appetite and couldn't touch a thing. My stomach was a battleground of aches and pains. That look? You sure you won't have a steak? Oh, no, no. It's all I can stand to watch you eat. I'm sorry. I hate to admit it, but I'm not well. My stomach is full of pain and I'm running a fever. What I can do, Captain, 
I noticed choke cherry bushes down by the river. I, I seem to remember my mother brewing a remedy she called choke cherry tea. Choke cherry tea? That is poison. Sure is, sir. It's the same. I want you to go out and get some of the berries and the twigs. Oh, but sir. Do as I say. Yes, sir. Driar brought back the twigs and the berries. Under my direction, he cooked them into a black and evil-looking fluid. Over the protests of the men, I drank two cups of the foul stuff. Then I sat by the fire and waited. I began to sweat, and at first my stomach felt worse. Two hours passed. Everybody was asleep but George Drouillard and me. George? George? Yes, Captain. The pain is gone. And the fever. Oh. Well, I guess if that stuff does not kill a man, it kills what is ailing him. You think you could fry me an elk steak? <laughs> I sure could, sir. <laughs> morning came, I was completely myself. We broke camp and moved ahead over rough country abounding in rocks and gullies, in prickly pear and rattlesnakes. By the evening of the second day, we were glad to camp, eat, and fall into the sleep of exhausted men. Morning found us renewed. We pushed on over the rough country. You hear that, sir? Sounds like a waterfall. We moved forward. The sound became a roar, and the river was partially obscured by the white spray of the water as it spilled down the face of the bluff. It was a spectacular sight, even from the imperfect position we occupied. Will you look at that? That is the greatest sight in the world. If we climb up on these rocks, we'll get a better view. Yes, sir. Uh, we climbed a ridge of rock which roughly paralleled the river some distance from the falls and at a higher elevation. From here, we could see water pouring over nearly perpendicular cliffs, dropping 80 to 100 feet to strike across 300 yards of river with a boiling, vaporous impact. While the men made camp and cooked a sumptuous meal of buffalo hump, trout, and parched corn, I wrote a detailed description of the falls, which did seem to have the advantage of a first impression. Indeed, Billy Clark and I were right about our choice of rivers, but making portage around the Great Falls was going to be a fearsome task. I decided to send Joe Fields back to the main camp with word of our discovery. <laughs> Today, Joe Fields transformed our camp with the news he brought. Captain Lewis had led him and the others to the fabled Great Falls. I watched all the small doubts and skepticism leave the men to be replaced by a new spirit of unity and a desire to go forward. Obviously, it was time to break camp, even if it meant moving Sacagawea. With the help of Charbonneau, we made a bed for her in the white pirogue, launched our boats, to do battle with the swiftly moving river. All right, put some muscle into it. Oh! Look out ahead. Quickly, pair. Quickly, pair. The water's only waist deep. Take right to the water. Pull! Pull! It took three days for us to reach Portage Creek, just below the falls, where Meriwether had set up a camp, which would be our base during the portage. I gave orders for Shields and Bratton to help Charbonneau construct a tent shelter for the ailing Sacagawea. Then climbed up on a high point with Meriwether Lewis for a view of the falls. Beautiful sight, isn't it? Yes. Is that all you have to say? Well, I'm thinking of the portage. We uh, have a lot of equipment to move. There's several more falls beyond this first one, I suppose. Five and all in a ten-mile stretch of river. And here's I can calculate, the portage will be about 18 miles. Over rough ground? The ground could be worse. 
What worries me is an overabundance of strictly paired rattlesnakes and unpredictable weather. I guess the last few days have changed from heat to cold to rain to wind. We've had hailstorm and a flash flood. Maybe we'd better find a place to hide the white barrow. That 50 foot boat is our biggest. At the far end, we can make a couple of dugouts to replace it. The men can carry the light baggage. For the canoes and the heavy gear, we'll build trucks. Trucks? Out of what? All I see is a stand of cottonwood. Well, it may not be the strongest of wood, but we have no choice. There's one big tree near the creek that's about two feet in diameter. We can cut across sections of it for wheels. Oh, well, it might work. Got to work. Unless you want to spend the winter here. No, thanks. How is that, could you wear? Worse. I think we're going to lose her. We did Floyd. Sure it's the same complaint? I don't really know. I uh, wish I were more of a doctor. How have you been treating her? Cataplasms of bark and laudanum. Doesn't help. You know, we might try something that cured me of a violent abdominal disorder on the way to the fall. Oh, huh? what's that? Choked cherry tea. Hmm. Don't know anything about it. We can't let her die. Not without trying it, I guess. In the hollow at the bottom of the bluff, we'll find some choke cherry bushes. We'll pick enough twigs and fruit to brew several quarts. You know, Meriwether, I hate to think of what would happen to the baby if she should die. You're fond of her and that baby, aren't you? Oh, uh, Charbonneau treats her badly. If she dies, it'll be his fault. I had doubts about the choke cherry tea, although I said nothing to Merriweather. After all, it was a last resort. We took the concoction to the tent where the suffering Sacagawea lay. Charbonneau admitted us. How is she, Charbonneau? Start of the time, out of her head. In the fever. Right now, she sleeps. Uh, gentlemen, uh, I'm worried. Worried? Well, what, what do I do if she dies? How will I care for the child? Where will I find milk? There's no need to indulge yourself in that kind of thinking. Sacagawea is still alive. Captain Lewis brought a new medicine. Uh, a new medicine. What good can it possibly do after the bark and the laudanum has failed? No, Captain, it is most difficult when, when a man faces the loss of a beloved wife. It's difficult for us, too. As doctors, we hate to lose a patient. As leaders, we hate to lose a follower. And as human beings, we hate to lose a valued friend. Now, do you think you can make her drink this medicine? I can try. You'll have to do better than that. Waker, tell her it has a vile and bitter taste, but it also has great curative powers. If you have to, force it down. A pint now, another pint tonight, a third in the morning. Captain Clark and I will be back again tomorrow. If there's an emergency, you know where to find us. That night, while the men ate a good and ample meal... We assigned groups to the necessary preliminary tests in the portage. Sergeant Ordway and a detail would build the trucks. Sergeant Gass and his squad would carefully mark the portage route with stakes. And Sergeant Pryor and his men were charged with the hiding of the white pirogue and the making of another cache. In the morning after breakfast and after the men had begun their tasks, Meriwether and I went to find out the condition of our patient, Dr. Jawia. No sign of life at the tent. Also, no sign of death. We'll soon find out. Jump on off. Come in. Come in. Captain Clark. Captain Lewis. Good morning. Dr. Joey, you're better. Why, it's like a miracle. I am weak, but the pain is gone. Soon I will be on my feet. Nah, this trip is too much for her. This trip is filled with us. No, please not. Sickness comes any place, any time. No, no. Gentlemen, I am compelled to take her away. Back to where living is easier. You don't mean that. I do, Captain Louis. Issue me a warrant for my pay. Nobody quits in the middle of this kind of job. You know that. I seem to remember you begging for this job back at Fort Mandan. And my money, please. Sacagawea must go to a better planet. Tristan, I am ashamed of you. Be quiet, squaw. No, Tristan. This squaw will speak. 
She will go on with the captain. She will help them to know her people and get them horses to ride over the shining mountain. She will hope that you do not desert, that you do your promised work. This is not an expedition assembled for private gain, Trevor, no. None of us enlisted in the hope of getting rich. You're a member of the Corps of Discovery. And I've had more than enough of it, Captain. Only fools go through this kind of ordeal for $25 per month and a very poor kind of keep. Because of Sacagawea, I won't put you under arrest and have you tried before a court-martial. Just once, I'll remind you that when you enlisted, you also pledged yourself to the government of the United States. Either you live up to your pledge and return with honor with the rest of us, or you will go back a prisoner in disgrace. The portage began. Boats were loaded on the cottonwood truck. Ropes were attached, and the men pulled the trucks over the rocky, bumpy portage road we had staked across the uneven plain. into it. Oh! If you was, we'd have no worrying about how to cross the mountain. Now, come on! Pull! The men kept on pulling with all their might, plodding through fields of prickly pears. The thorns pierced the soles of their moccasins and cut into their feet. Sergeant Pryor watched the group towing his truck very, very carefully calling for a rest period just before the weakest of the men was about to collapse. All right, all right, halt! Lock those wheels and rest. Hey, Freyos. And what do you want now, Grisette? He left the wind. Yeah, maybe it'll make us a little cooler dragging up the next rise. Strong enough to do more than that. What do you mean? Why not put up the sail? Are you crazy, Cruzac? We have wheels last time I looked. Oh, good idea. Uh, Captain Lewis? I heard the suggestion. Go ahead. Try it. Hooray! Get that sail up fast before the wind quits. They raised the sail. Cruzat manipulated it so that it caught the full force of the wind. The truck began to roll. It picked up speed. The men leaped on for a dry land sailing trip. We're just too blame weak for axles. Better use the mast for a new axle. It'll be strong enough. All right, men. On the double. While the unremitting labor of the portage went on, I established another camp at the far end of the falls. On the way back from moving personal baggage from old camp to new, the wind began to blow. The sky darkened. The sun was entirely swallowed up in a night-like blackness. With me was Sacagawea and her baby, and Charbonneau. My man York had gone on up ahead to do a little hunting. Come quickly, under those trees. No, Robert, it's not high enough ground in case of flood. Over this way. took cover under a ledge of rock near the top of the ravine. We crouched there for at least half an hour while the rain pounded down. Do not cry, Bucky. It is only rain. Rain that makes all things grow. Uh, this kind of rain beats things to death. Well, it never lasts very long. Uh, we can hope not, Captain. We can hope not. I looked and saw a torrent rushing down the ravine and rising toward us. Quick! Everybody out of here! Mon Dieu, it's a flood! 
clawed our way up the side of the ravine, with Charbonneau in the lead, of course. Just as the rising waters carrying all kinds of debris touched my feet, Charbonneau panicked and couldn't seem to move. He saved me! He saved me! I cannot see! Don't move, Charbonneau! Move! Wait, stop! Wait, you don't let me save me! Get up there, faster! I'll drown you! The trip worked. He scrambled up the rest of the way, even offering a helping hand to Saka Chewy and the baby. I pushed from below. The water rose to my waist. Finally, we all climbed into safety. When I turned to look back where we had been, the ledge had vanished, covered by at least five feet of rushing water. The day seemed to creep past. We observed the 4th of July with a fusillade of rifle fire and the issuing of the last of the whiskey, and then continued our work. Finally, on July 15th, a full month after our arrival at the Great Falls, we were ready to move on. We loaded the boat and were about to push out into the river once again when I noticed Sacagawea making marks with a stick in the damp earth near the riverbank. I asked her what she was doing. We near the country of my people. I write in the earth. I say you are friends of the Shoshone. Ensuing travel became more and more difficult. Oars would not prevail against the stronger currents we encountered. We had to use the poles and the tow ropes in combination with oars. The slowest, most agonizing method of transportation known to man. From dawn to dusk, each day, the courage and staying powers of the men were tested and retested. Now and then, along the shore, we would see Indian lodges and teepees, some long abandoned, others hastily vacated, as if their tenants took to the hills at the first sight of them. Then, on the 27th of July, we arrived at another river junction, the Three Forks, where the mountains leveled into a long, high plain. We camped on a height where we could see ahead for many miles. Captain Clark, there. We were down there near the river. The enemy came on swift horses. Five years ago? Yes. We fled up the river. Our warriors made a stand, but they were too few, and the Gorvanto were too strong. Many of my people were wounded. Eight or ten were killed. I tried to run. An enemy warrior rode me down. He made me his prisoner. Your family was with you when it happened? We were separated in the first rush. I do not know if they lived or they died. I'm sorry. Maybe some of them lived through it. Maybe, uh, maybe you will find them again. I hope so. But when? 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 Why do they hide from us? Why do they stay in the hills? Maybe they fear my writing in the earth is only a trick. In the meantime, all we can do is keep on. Up the largest river of the three. Until we run out of water. We had to have horses. We had to get across the high mountains. But the timid Shoshones remained in hiding. And we kept on pulling and pulling our way up the river. Listening to Horizons West, the continued story of the Lewis and Clark Expedition. Chapter 5, The Great Falls, starred Harry Bartell as Meriwether Lewis and John Anderson as William Clark. Featured in the cast were Sebastian Cabot, Carl Swenson, Helen Gerald, Don Diamond, Frank Gerstle, and Herb Ellis. Our story was written by Carly and William Tunberg and directed by William Lally. Michael Rye speaking. This is the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service.